It's like having your own C-3PO. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Hello and welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympics fans. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking Tokyos today. And Tokyos, I mean, 1964 versus 2020, because this really freaked me out when I saw it um, the other day, the hashtag 500 days to go. We are now 490 Something. Eight, I think. Uh, days from Tokyo 2020. Yeah. It's really coming quickly. Really yeah. coming quickly. Those so, 500 days are going to go by before you know it. I know. I know. <laughs> There's a lot of planning to do. Oh, there man. There is. There is. We're working. <laughs> right. I can only imagine what the organizing committee is like. Right. On the one hand, they were probably like, hooray for the 500 days. Mm -hmm. And then there was that one guy in the back who was looking at the sheet of everything that needs to got to get done. And he was just not at the party. He was not eating the cake. He was not doing, he was sitting there going, but we have this to do and this to do. And he's, you know, furiously sending out email reminders and I feel bad for him. Go get a piece know, of cake, dude. I know. I know. But it was really cool because they released their pictograms. Yes. Which was so exciting to see. And I know we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but, you know, okay. I, I do like myself a good pictogram. I know. And, okay, I will be totally honest. I have never been very interested in the pictograms, mm -hmm. I guess. And I never really paid attention that they change every time. <laughs> but then I went back and I was looking – I was like, oh, of course they do. But because you never see them side by side. Right. You don't realize how significantly they are designed and redesigned. So, yes. Right. It's it's part of the whole package, that whole look of the games. One of the, the cool things about Tokyo 2020 is that the pictograms were first introduced in Tokyo 1964. Yes, that was a fun little fact that I found out. I found yes. lots of fun little facts. Right. So when, when, about 1964 when yeah. we started talking when, about this when i looked at them side by side you see some inspiration from the 1964 pictograms in the ones from today and they're really cool they're so cool how they use white space to create yes. uniforms or elements of their apparatuses it's i think they've done a really good job with the pictograms Right, because the pitch grams from 64 were black and white, as mm -hmm. are these. But in other Olympics, they have used other colors. Mm -hmm. And other blank, the, the blank space is not always white or black. It'll be blue and not square. And mm -hmm. But those, I agree, had, had a lot of echoes of 64, which was great. Yeah, really, really I like really those cool. connections. So why don't we talk a little bit about some of the things that made Tokyo 1964 a very special Olympics? Should we start with the numbers? Yeah, let's start with the numbers. Okay. So there were 93 countries that participated, a little over 5,000 athletes, though only 13% were women. Wow. Yeah. And there were 163 medal events. And when you compare that with what we are expecting for 2020. Yes. Let me scroll myself to those numbers. So there are going to be over 11,000 athletes, so more than double. And there's near gender, they're expecting near gender parity, which is very cool, which is very. amazing. This is going to be the, this is each Olympics. They get closer and closer to 50, 50. Mm -hmm. It's right. not quite. Um, I think they said it was something like a 40 something, 50 something. Okay. Okay. But it was, pre it was pretty good. Nice. They're going to be about double the number of events, 339 and more than double the nations. 206 are expected. Wow. Which is just about every country in the world pretty much wow and then there'll be additional teams like uh the refugee, the refugee. team mm -hmm. those kinds of things they are not official yet and this is all expected okay but still it'll be about twice the size which is amazing so when you think about how the games have grown 
since then. It's just kind of unbelievable. And I, you could see it when you, when you do look at the pictograms side by side and you look at how many more sports there are yes. in the, in the Olympic program. It is incredible and astounding and kind of overwhelming. You, well, overwhelming to think about, but also when you think about pulling off a games, a summer games to, in today's world, it's pretty amazing that they can do an, an event that big. So in terms of cost, talking about pulling it off. Mm-hmm. So the 64 Olympics cost about $282 million US. Okay. Which is a lot of money back then. Which is, yeah. And that's not adjusted. That's just what the actual okay. um, number is. Do you want to know what they're estimating this one to be? How many billions or tens of billions? $25 billion. Wow. Wow. And that's just the estimates. You know it's going to be more than that. Wow. And that's like four times what the original estimates were. I I know because I was reading uh, an article that was talking a little bit about the 64 games and how much of Tokyo's economy that budget was. But they also put a lot of money into like developing the Shinkansen bullet train, which I think debuted around that time, which yes, it did. completely changed how transportation worked in that country. Well, one of the things that I read about a lot when they were talking about 64 was this was really Japan and particularly Tokyo's reemergence from the post-World War II era. Right. This was the idea of we are no longer a defeated, broken literally leveled country, we're coming back onto the world stage. Mm -hmm. So they didn't just build venues. There was a lot of civic development that went into it. And and from everything I read, it was a very successful games, very well received, very well run, as you would expect. Right. And just it was a it was a very different feeling from Rome. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously Rome and that whole sort of uh, Roman holiday summer. Right, right. Also, Italy's reemergence. Exactly. From the World War II era. So I think yes. it was interesting that that both played such a role. The Olympics played such a role in both countries. But yeah, a really, a really joyful event. Right. And and speaking of emergence, it really built on the technology. And technology was really, it, it was kind of one of the things that made Japan emerge as a technology giant. And so that was the first Olympics to use computers to keep statistics and the first time satellite television was used to broadcast events, which so made... no more smuggling tapes like we read about. Right. In, in and from 1960 and, and flying them over the ocean. Now you could have satellite technology just beam them over, which is pretty amazing when you think about that happened within four years. Right, the big difference, the big jump. And did you know that they're working on more new technologies for for 2020? Well, I read about 8K, the 8K televisions, but I did not understand them. Everyone I read was very excited about this. Right, so it's 16 times the pixels of HD and so four times the pixels of 4K. So you're going to talk uh, talking about some amazing resolution and if you think about how clear and sharp HD is, it's just going to be way more than that. Oh, well, I think NBC just doubled its makeup budget for Mike Tirico. <laughs> right? Doubled their makeup budget for everyone. Oh, We're just going to have to get used to people looking not... Uh, we're going to have to use, get used to regular human faces, I think. I don't think anybody is beautiful. I'm not sure anybody is beautiful enough for AK. Yeah, that's that's a little rough. So it's interesting that technology was so big in Japan and that really helped Japan's emergence as a as the technology giant. But, you know, they've been kind of overtaken by uh, Kore- the Korean technology. So LG and Samsung are just huge. But now they're working on it again. So I was reading an article from France 24 where they've got Panasonic has a a whole Olympics department that is Ooh. working on game games time tech. So when visitors arrive at the airport, they're going to be greeted by multilingual robots primed to assist them and automatic chairs designed to take them to a destination selected by smartphone. 
And then they're also working on an automatic translation system that can be used at at counters, like it sounds like retail counters. So you could speak your own language and have the translation appear on the other side of the screen. It's like having your own C-3PO. I know. Can you imagine? I'm a little concerned about the chairs, though, because what if they <laughs> like hold you captive and take you someplace? <laughs> right. right. What if you want to walk, you know? Maybe you want to yeah. stretch your legs after didn't, getting off the plane. Yeah, didn't anybody watch Wally, where all the people just used the technology and got all sloppy and fat and couldn't move and were all going to die because they couldn't grow a plant? Right. But I, if you had a little robot dog come and greet me, I would pet that robot dog. I don't care right. if it's a robot. <laughs> So that would be really cool. I am really interested to see how it, it's going to be. Toyota's working on a car called the e Pallet, which is a driverless car without a steering wheel, which is going to be able to move around in a what they call a predefined zone. So it's gonna, there's probably going to be a zone where these driverless cars can be, and they'll know how to do that track and oh, take you around. That would be fun. Right? It would be like that. Okay, so now we are learning all about Allison's childhood. I had this game that you had a shopping cart that went around mm -hmm. the the store that was the board, and it worked on a magnet. Ooh! So you could move your cart around to get to the right thing, and you. So this car is like that my does dream yes. from when I was four. Right. Wow. I'm very curious how that will work. There are uh, this article also says there are even rumors that a flying car will be used to light the flame. Well, a flying car will definitely. I'm I'm going to put my vote in that a flying car will bring the flame into the stadium. Okay, I'm going to go with that. They're going to have a person, non tech, do the flame. They're going to go old school, but the the flame will be brought in by some sort of high tech flying. Car. Yeah, I would not be surprised. But you know, the torch relay is perfect for that kind of thing. Because remember yes. how Montreal did the laser beam and like Australia did the scuba diver. Right. And they and, had the flame up in space at various times. Right. And Pyeongchang did what robots and things mm -hmm. like that. Well, there's a few more details announced about the 2020 Olympic torch relay along with the 500 days to go celebration. So the torch is going to be lit in Greece on March 12th. And then it's going to get to Japan on March 20, 2020. And the flame will be carried to Ishinomaki Mini Mihama Tsunami Recovery Mo Memorial Park in Ishinomaki Miyagi Prefecture. And that was part of one of the, the areas that was devastated by the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. And then it's going to travel through Miyagi and Iwate Prefectures by train and then one of those legs is going to be a steam locomotive, and then it's going to make its way up to Fukushima, which is synonymous with the, the tsunami disaster. And then it will be, uh, that's when the whole relay will really start, and it's going to start at the J Village soccer facility in Fukushima Prefecture. Oh, that's nice. So, and that'll be so cool. one of the things, I think it's very interesting how the, the dead, and the little I know of Japanese culture, the dead are very much still a part of your life and mm -hmm. your family and mm -hmm. and how they're bringing that in. And then in 1964, the man who lit the cauldron was born the day of uh, Hiroshima. Yeah. Of the atomic bomb. And so they in both Olympics, they sort of bring the tragedies, the, their recent tragedies. Mm hmm into this joyful time right and let's and, not forget and let's right include. yes inclusive and kind of honoring that event that happened as disastrous it was we still have to remember you know one of the things that we talked a, a ton about that i loved about pyeongchang was i felt like i got to know something about korean culture like i really got right. a good sense mm -hmm. and i feel like this is going to be the same thing yeah and it's exciting because you know, I, I don't know about you, but growing up, I didn't learn a ton about Asian culture. It Nothing. wasn't, you know, we learned about Western civilization and like European history. And maybe you touched a little bit into Africa and Egypt, but you just didn't learn about the other side of the world. It's like basically in my history learning, Japan didn't, ex Japan existed from like 
when it was discovered, mm-hmm. you know, by Western and then didn't exist again until World War II. Right. So, so much to learn. So much to learn. So let's talk fun stories. Yes. The good stuff. Yeah. So lots of things that we read about in uh, Rome 1960 come back. Like? South Africa was banned in 64. They were not allowed to compete. There was that issue in 60. That's right. Should we let them? Should we let them? Well, Mm -hmm. they didn't last another Olympiad. And then there was our friend Abebe Bakila won Mm -hmm. the marathon again. This time he got to go into the stadium. In the marathon. Yeah. (laughs) And he was the first one to ever win back-to-back golds in the marathon. Which is impressive. That is so impressive. And then another of our friends from Rome, uh, Australian swimmer Don Frazier, came back. And this one is one of my favorite stories because in March of 64, she was driving, crashed the car, and her mother was killed. Yeah. Yeah, I am speechless. I know. And then she comes back, you know, six months later – and wins the gold in the 100 meter fray. And she was the first swimmer to ever win the event in three consecutive games. Which is amazing. And did you find anything about like her thoughts or what happened? I mean, it's it's amazing that she comes back from this horrific car crash. But right. you, you still deal with the fact that I crashed the car and my mother died as a result of this. How right. do you it, deal? Yeah, she has she had a very tumultuous life. Okay. Um, both during this time and after the Olympics. So whenever there's an interview or a biography, it's it's chock-a-block. She's an interesting person to read about. So if you can get your hands on a Don Fraser biography, I guarantee you 1980s Dynasty and Dallas don't have nothing on this woman's life. Wow. Well, maybe we should think about one for book club sometime. Oh, yeah. I don't, I will have to, if you know what's the good Don <laughs> Frazier biography, let us know. And then, of course, my favorite story is Larissa Latinina. Mm-hmm. See, I said the Russian you name. Did. So you did. Thank well, you. Actually, she was Ukrainian. <laughs> oh, but, but at the time, so, so... she competed, of course, for the Soviet Union. And she was the ripe old age of 29. Can you imagine a gymnast today? Wow. At age 29. Holy she had two God. kids by wow. this point. Wow. She had competed in 56 and 60. And she's like, Oh, I come back. I need more medals. And she ended up with 18 medals altogether over the three Olympics. And her record stood until Michael Phelps broke it in 2012. And I will argue, fight me if if you disagree. I don't care. That Larissa Latinina's achievement is greater because the number of medals she had available to her. I would agree. It's way less than what Michael Phelps did. I would agree. Swimming is one of those sports where you can compete in so many events. Of course, it's easy to get a record. Right. Or, well, it's not. Okay, let me back up because I know I hear about this. It's not easy to get a record. But the potential for you getting a record is incredible. And the fact that we can laud that versus somebody 29. Because the only other old gymnast you hear about these days is like the 41 or 40 something year old from Uzbekistan the vaulter you know who I'm talking about Oksana Chuzovitina exactly and that's pretty much and it's amazing that she continues to compete but she does just focus on the vault right and now Alina uh, Mustafina was trying to make a comeback she just had a just had a baby in the last two years. Wow. So she's trying to make a comeback as as well. But that's how remarkable this is. That right. This woman was not only competing, but winning. She still holds the record for the most individual medals as opposed wow. to team okay. or relay. relay. Okay. It's so incredible. She's still up that's there. That's incredible. Yeah. You'd never hear. 20 is old for a gymnast. It is, I mean, they're talking about Simone Biles. Yes, being like, oh, she's ancient. coming back. She's 21. Oh, she's ancient. Yeah, right? Oh, that kills me. Kills Dude. me. Dude. And one of the other big medals was uh, Smokin' Joe Frazier. That's when he was an amateur and before he became the heavyweight pro that uh, defeated Muhammad Ali later yes. on. And uh, he he had this devastating left hook that got him through to the semifinals. And in the semifinal, he broke his thumb. He didn't tell anyone because this is how he actually got into the games 
I right? read that. Yeah, where the guy who had gotten the heavyweight spot broke his thumb and so couldn't compete. Frazier was the alternate and got to go. Right. So then Can he- you imagine what the U.S. boxing team was like if Joe Frazier is your alternate? Right. <laughs> Holy cow. Right. So then he, uh, Frazier, had to compete against Hans Huber from Germany in the finals. And Huber, this is another interesting fun fact. He wanted to go to the Olympics for wrestling, but made boxing instead, (laughs) which just boggles my mind how that works. But that's also back in the day when probably, you know, maybe I won't. You didn't specialize quite so young. You didn't specialize. And I would say the the competitive level wasn't as intense. That might be not the best phrasing, but you look at the times today or the the musculature of people and how sports has developed. Well, also, if you think about you're dealing with a German athlete who is competing in 64, born in, say, 1940. Yeah. What country is he growing up in? Yeah. So, so the did... world was totally a different place with not many right. resources for a lot of athletes, except for maybe All the I'm Soviet saying... Union. Right. All I'm saying is I want Hans Huber on my side because he will either take you out with a punch or he will throw you to the ground. (laughs) But the final match in that heavyweight boxing tournament was really tough for Frazier because he had that injury. So he couldn't use his left hook the way he wanted it to. He still won by judge's decision. Three to two. Amazing. And, And went on to become heavyweight champion of the world. I know. I know. And back on the track, um, Superfan Sarah told us, like, one of the other amazing uh, events was Peter Snell winning 800 and the 1500 gold in the same Olympics, which is crazy. You just don't see that kind of repetition. You see, like, the 100 and 200. But those two distances seem so, like, the strategy seems to be much different or the, the way you have to run them has to be well i don't different. think i could run 800 meters oh you could maybe not that fast but you could i mean run. somebody would have to be chasing me <laughs> with a knife the 1500 is just out of the question i think it's the short legs it just takes me so many more steps it's like a chihuahua <laughs> you know versus say a standard poodle but we got some highlight i mean there are some potential good highlights i know we're a, a year plus out but Katie Ledecky could win a bunch of gold medals in swimming, and she could beat Latinina's record for gold medals set in an, in individual events. Uh, right? No, just the uh, oh the number of gold medals total. Gold medals, okay. yeah. Okay, the woman wow. with the most gold medals. Wow, yeah, that would be incredible. And of course, other Team Olympic Fever member Kim Rohde is hoping to go back for her seventh Olympics. And if she gets any kind of type of medal, longest winning streak of any athlete in Olympic history. In any that... sport, male or female. And she's going. I mean, we know. She's training. She's working yeah, at it. She's, she's amazing. Right. Just keeping that, keeping your focus for that long, never mind the physical thing. Right. But just wanting to go out and train and train. And when we talked to her, she talked just the everyday shooting and it's not like she's doing a ton of cross training you know it's not like they do a lot of different things Mm -hmm. it's you shoot and you shoot and you shoot and you shoot Mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing yeah and she'd be a mom with a medal which makes me always happier (laughs) i like when the moms and dads win the medals it should be a good Olympics. One other thing that's really cool about 2020 is that they are reusing some venues from the 64 games. We like a good legacy. Yes. So am I, do I get to say these? Yoyogi National mm-hmm. Gymnasium, mm-hmm. Nippon Budokan. 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 Okay. And Tokyo Metropolitan Gymnasium. Yeah, I could say that. <laughs> They're all going to be reused, but for different sports than they were used for in 64. Oh, okay. And then the new national stadium is built in the exact same site as the old national stadium. And I would imagine that people who will be in sitting down in the new national stadium will be happier because 
the seats in the old Nas- national stadium were those just those hard plastic ones with no backs. Oh. You know what I'm talking. You know the style I'm talking about, right? Yeah, like the high school bleachers. Yes, but they would be individual seats, oh. but it would have no back to it, so you would still have, still be quite uncomfortable at that yeah. point. But I hope they got some cushier seats. So we will. I wonder. We'll- I have to look at the art. I didn't see um, the architectural renderings. I wonder if it echoes. If the new stadium echoes the old one, I bet it does. Yeah, that'd be it'll be interesting to see. I think we have some pictures somewhere from when um, Ben and I went to Tokyo. Gosh, it was a long time ago now. We went in 2007. So we did go and visit the old National Stadium and they had a little museum underneath. And we've got this. We do have a picture of Ben Fit. Uh, no, uh, he, they had a podium, you know, that you could stand on and take pictures of. But if he was on uh, the first place, he had to bend over sideways. <laughs> to stand up right not now. meant to win a gold medal in tokyo <laughs> no not at all it's going to be exciting it'll be a good and you'll I be going back gonna... yes we will be going back it is exciting. got to figure that out 500 <laughs> less than 500 yep. days yep. to do less it. <laughs> than 500 days now the one thing i don't want to forget to mention mm-hmm. is because we've talked about this tokyo 64 because of the crazy heat waves from mm-hmm. rome 1960 they moved the games to October. Which makes sense. Which makes sense. Mexico City also had the games in October mm-hmm. because of the heat. Are they doing that this time? No. No. So we had a conversation maybe about a month ago talking about how worried the organizers have become because this past summer, it was literally so hot in Japan, people were dropping dead. Yes. So it will be July 24th to August 9th, dead in the middle of the highest summer heat and humidity Mm -hmm. and typhoon season. This could be. You know, you have to wonder what goes into setting that date and if broadcast has a lot to say about that because it is during, you know, NBC is the one of the biggest broadcast sponsors so they are you know they have a lot of yeah they have a lot of they have a lot to say and i bet i wonder if they want it in the vacation time Mm -hmm. for north america i believe most of europe right i don't know about asia but i'm sure in japan at least but yeah i have a a feeling because even atlanta they did it in july i'm like what are you people thinking? but it has to be you know, this is so North America, Europe centric. Right. And I think you're absolutely right that it's the television revenue is driving the bus. Right. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed mm-hmm. that there is no get much or it gets much hotter or it gets. Yeah. Oh, Don't but... burn any coal between now and then. Well, let's have, we got some other Tokyo 2020 news that came out. Some other announcements. <laughs> Thailand has withdrawn from all weightlifting events for 2020 because of on do- ongoing doping scandals, which is incredible because, yeah, they ju- they just keep getting doping scandal after doping scandal in that sport. And it's not good. And they are fighting for their Olympic life in 2017. Nine countries, including Russia and China, served one year bans in weightlifting because of violations from Rio. So that's interesting because Thailand does have some pretty hardcore weightlifters in like world rankings. This past week, a Spanish weightlifter, Lydia Valentin, Mm -hmm. was awarded the gold medal from London because all three of the medalists were found to have doped. Oh, that is insane. So the entire podium was wiped out. She finished fourth and now she's got the gold medal six years later. Yeah, okay. Weightlifting has to go. Yeah, they need to. I hate to say it because I do like some Olympic weightlifting. It's really impressive, but it's not as impressive when you're able to do your sport because of substances. Yeah, no, there's. I'm going to say it boxing and weightlifting need to go. Boxing, uh, yeah. I hate to say that too because. Boxing is an incredible sport for a lot of people, but 
when the organization can't get its act together and you just have scandal upon scandal, just something's got to give. I don't, I don't know. Which and is maybe really if they sad. kick them out, it will help. Maybe. And that's hard Less because, it, right, because that hurts athletes when they, you know, it really does. But because it's doping. Right. It's doping does. Doping does. So will that be enough of a disincentive to get back on track? I don't know. It'll be interesting, though. Also, Tokyo 2020 commemorative stamps have gone on sale in Japan. These are exciting. Uh, they are designed by Akira Tamaki and feature uh, Mirai Tawa and Someyati, the mascots, as well as the new stadium. So you can buy a sheet of 10 for 920 yen, and that includes a 100 yen donation for games preparations, which I thought that was kind of smart. That's not a whole lot of money. You know, an extra buck or so goes towards the Olympic Committee. They've got a million sheets available, so maybe that can nice. help raise some money. Better so. than, you know, selling things like gold medals. Hey, we'd like to give a special shout out to our Patreon patrons. You know, we invest a lot of time and money in this show and we appreciate the patrons who help make us happen make help us make it happen. Join our group at patreon.com slash Fever and get special patron benefits, including audio you can't get on the show. And you know, uh, our patron Meredith asked for a roller derby interview saying, did you get that message? I didn't. Oh, yeah. She asked us, you know, said, I know it's not an Olympic sport, but I would like Allison to interview Jill about roller derby. Okay. Maybe we can do that for a little Maybe, patron and yeah. little patron audio. Well, you know what? We'd have to get Tessa Gobo, our favorite rower, to come back. We could and do talk that. about her roller der- derby experience. We could do that. We can do that. Speaking of Tessa, it's time for our Team Olympic Fever update. So this past weekend, Boston Roller Derby had a big roller derby tournament. Their first roller derby tournament, which was very exciting, it was called Lobster Roll. And Tess uh, competed. I got to officiate her for two games, which was nice. They they played four games. Boston played four games. And they won two, I think. And they lost two, I believe. This is hard for me because I never know who's competing in, unless I'm officiating Boston. But even then, I never know what the final score is because it's just not something I think about. Right, and you're you know, a good official. Yeah, you're not yeah, paying attention exactly, to the outcome. Exactly. You're paying attention to the action. You know, and it's always sad. Well, not sad, but it's always a nice surprise when you look up at the score and go, oh, the half is almost over. Or, oh, I, this is a much closer game than I realized. But Tess got MVP for, I believe, her last game, which was against Houston. Even though they lost, she got MVP for, for the Boston team. So that was very nice. Doesn't surprise me at all because nope. Tessa is fabulous she is from good news to not so great news it turns out uh ilana myers taylor has a concussion well she's not even on olympic feet she's not on tofu well she kind of is we adopted her remember okay okay but she uh ilana myers taylor does have a concussion and she broke her arm from her crash at the world championships and bobsled uh, the other week which is really sad and and concussions are no no joke so Hopefully she it will not be a difficult recovery from that. Hopefully her brain is doing okay. And uh, we wish her all the best. And other sad news, Chloe Kim broke her ankle at the Burton U.S. Snowboarding Champs. She had the surgery. Okay. She posted about it. There's a pin in her ankle. Okay. She's acting like a very spirited 18-year-old. And her spirits are good. And she posted all this video of herself. Well, I'm sure it wasn't she who post recorded mm-hmm. it of herself coming off the anesthesia. Oh, <laughs> so she's got a lot of humor about this. Uh, definitely. So she's, she's looking good, but yeah. yeah so her okay. season clearly is over. Right. Um, and I hope this doesn't, uh, that they're going to stick the pin in it and she'll be okay. okay. Yeah. Hope so. We wish you a speedy recovery, Chloe. And it's still the end of the biathlon world championships, which this is, it's a long event. They have a lot more races that go on during this uh, time, but our biathlete Claire Egan had her best ever finish in the 7.5 kilometer sprint. She came in 11th, which qualified her for the 10 K pursuit, 
where she finished 12th. So that started off her championships with a, a bang. I did not mean to say that. I really did. As, I, as it's coming out, I feel like, oh boy. But then in the 15K individual, she had a rough day. Uh, she placed 53rd, but she still had enough points for those events to qualify for the mass start race, which will happen this Sunday. That's a, I mean, she's been there a long time. Yes, it is a very, it's like a big full seven to 10 days of, yeah. of events, but it's like one event a day. So good luck, Claire. We hope you do well. And hope it's not because this was supposed to be her last season. I'm my fingers are crossed that it's not. I'm hoping that she did well enough to go. Oh, I'm I'm getting I'm seeing big improvements. Maybe I'll see what will go on next year. Because I still got my big athletes commission job in the International Biathlon Union. I should stick around. Maybe. I hope so. Ah, oh, anything else in our? On our plate of tofu? No, I finished my tofu. All right. Hey, don't forget that one of the easiest ways to support our show is by shopping on Amazon through our website at olimfever.com. So the next time you need to get something from Amazon, please go to our website first and click on the Amazon banner. We get a little commission from your purchases, which really helps us put together more cool Olympic fever things as we get closer and closer to Tokyo 2020. And now we are less than 500 days. So we really have to narrow down what we're able to do in this time. And hopefully we can get the resources to put together some fun activities for all of you. And we appreciate your support for that. Um, you can buy our next book club selection. The that's second right. Mark. Joy Goodwin. I just received my copy this week. Did you? I have to get mine. I did. Yeah. So excited. Well, go to Amazon. Yeah. I'm excited about that book too. I am. Because that was a big, big story. But uh, moving on to other Olympic news, the Calgary 1988 sliding track might close. They had their last races there uh, because it's end of winter. The track needs a new refrigeration system because they're still on the original one, which is 33 years old now. They only. If you had a 33 year old refrigerator in your kitchen, <laughs> which I think I, I might. Don't know how... <laughs> I, I might don't know have. How well, it would be keeping the chicken cool. Right. And how inefficient it is energy wise, too. I mean, when you think about how much energy efficiency has changed. Yeah. I think about how much my energy efficiency has changed in 33 years. <laughs> They've only got partial funding to fix it. They've got $16.8 million and they need $8 million more to bring it back up to snuff. And they don't know if that will happen. Which is sad because if they had put their name in for 2026, that would have helped that track get the funding they need to stay open. And there are a lot of people who go, well, you know, we live around there and we never use a track or nobody ever uses this track. But the track actually gets used a lot. By I'm sure it's a training athletes. track for the it's, Canadian yeah. team. Well, it's a tra and it's a training track for a lot of people because they like re remember how Josh had had to go to push training there and they have push championships there. Yeah. They do a lot of stuff and and athletes from all over the world will go and train on that track. So it does get used it and they did have something a, a little program where you as a tourist could go down the track too. But I'm sure not just that's not something you do every day. Right. And it's, the slice yeah, of like athletes. The Lake, Placid, the Lake yes. Placid track, excuse me, where they exactly. have a little side gig. Of right. Giving you rides. Right. So hopefully they can get the funding they need to keep that track open because it's it would be a shame if that went to waste. Uh, we talked about the pictograms. There's going to be a new design book about the Munich 1972 designs. Um, there's uh, a Kickstarter out there for a new design book called Munich 72, the visual output of Otto Eichner's Department 11. Who was the star of our very first Olympic Fever episode. I know. That made me so excited when I saw that. Do you remember how hard I had to work <laughs> to pronounce his name correctly? And I am not going to try it again because I'm going to butcher it. But he was the original creator of Valdi. The, the first, first official mascot. Official mascot. The little dachshund from Munich. Yes. So that... And I took a quick look at that their Kickstarter thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. The book looks amazing. It does. 
And they've spent a lot of time. They spent three years researching it. They've done a lot of original interviews. They've gone to the the authors have gone and gotten original documents in German and had them translated so that they could get more of the behind the scenes aspects of it. So I mean, it it looks really cool. And so we- Olympic historian design person, Mm -hmm. you know, graphic people. This is your book. Exactly. You you need to get your hands on one of these. Exactly. We will have a link to that Kickstarter in our show notes. And unfortunately, we have to end on a sad note. There have been two pretty tragic deaths in the Olympic family over the last week or so. Uh, The first was Josef Feistmantel. He was a 1964 Winter Olympian, and he won Austria's first ever Olympic gold medal in luge, and he was a doubles luger. His partner was Manfred Stengel, and uh, he recently passed away. Isn't it amazing that it was 1964 before Austria Won a medal in luge. I know. You would think they'd be all over that. Yeah. Wow. But that's sad. And then tragically, track cyclist Kelly Catlin died this past week. She was a member of the U.S. Women's Pursuit track cycling team that earned a silver medal during the 2016 Games in Rio. And she and her team also earned three consecutive world championships between 2016 and 2018. Uh, She uh, took her own life. She was juggling a lot of things and and had also, speaking of Alana Myers-Taylor's concussion, she had had a concussion in December. And so uh, don't know how that brain injury affected how she felt. But but she uh, from things I had read, her family had noticed a drastic difference in her um, afterwards. And so she just it's it's tough. It's it's this one hit me. This yeah, one hit right, me a right. lot. Yeah. yeah. She's, I mean, she was a baby. She was 23. She right. was just part- a kid. And to look at her, she looked about 16. Right. And part of a set of triplets. Yeah. This so, one was rough. Yeah. And her family has been pretty open uh, talking about the struggles that they have had with um, the news. And it's just, it's phenomenally sad. So, um, yeah, our our thoughts go out to her and her or well her I don't even know what to say her thought our thoughts go out to her family um we actually are scheduled to talk with um a clinical psychologist who's part of the U.S. uh, U.S. Olympic Committee Sports Psychology and Mental Training Registry to talk about high performance athletes and the stress and anxiety and depression that they may feel so we are hoping to bring you that interview next week and find out more about w- what it's like to be at this level and the the pressure you feel to perform, especially if you're um, somebody who gives 100%, people who just put their all into everything and put a lot of pressure on themselves to be the best and how that can affect the rest of your life. And we do want to normalize talking about it. Yes. It's not a secret. It's not... Right. It's it happens, difficult and, for everyone involved. And, right. and we want to talk about it because right. it is an issue for a lot of Olympic athletes and a lot of them have started talking about it, which mm-hmm. is good. So yeah. we want to we want to make yeah. sure we hit this. Exactly. And so if you have questions about this topic, please let us know. You can email us at info at com. You can hit up our Facebook page or group Olympic Fever Podcast and on Twitter we're Olim Fever on Instagram we're Olim Fever as well um, we'd love to hear what you're thinking about this and what you'd like to know and we'll see what we can do to get some answers but um, it's tough it's tough it, you know we when we talk about the Olympics you know it's always faster higher stronger but there's always another side of that story and there's a there's a cost for faster higher stronger there is it be physical or or in this case clearly it was it was emotional and mental right and so uh, i think it's important that we do start touching on how that affects us or affects the athletes <sighs> but i hate to wrap it on a sad note i really do I know but and I don't, I got nothing for you. I got nothing. So, uh, well, on that note, well, I guess we'll wrap it up for this week. So thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you back here next week for more Olympic stories and uh, 
learn a little bit more about uh, what what an athlete's life is like at that level. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive. Stay in touch. Email us at olymfever at gmail.com. That's O-L-Y-M fever at gmail. You can also leave us a voicemail at 530-763-3837. That's 530-70-FEVER. We're on Twitter at Olymp Fever, and you can join in the conversation at our Facebook group, Olympic Fever Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. Fight me if, if you disagree. I don't care.